I'm Pamela Portnoy, and no one's okay. <laughs> what just happened all right that's a great great it's omen. gotta stay in you can't it's cut that in. It's <laughs> welcome back to no it's okay i am back today's guest is a professional screenwriter whose credits include the adventures of puss in boots trolls the beat goes on skylanders academy and strawberry shortcake her latest feature film one up is currently in post-production and will be coming out this year Ish. This year, I don't know when. We don't have a release date yet, which is uh, tricky because I, I'm planning a lot of trips this year. And so I need to know when I need to be back. But yeah, it's sometime this year. That's so exciting. She also yeah. shares her incredible screenwriting advice on her TikTok page. We've got the wonderful and talented Julia Yorks in the house. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here and there. Simultaneously. So, <laughs> so happy to meet you. I saw your content on TikTok and I have been absolutely obsessed. I'm not a screenwriter myself, but I still very much enjoy your content and I learn so much just by listening to you. I think well, the first one you. I saw was Hard Truths, which was so cool. Yeah, I like to kind of have a no bullshit approach. Um, I feel like this industry is so difficult and for any kind of creator you know any time of kind of artist actor it's just it's a it's really tough to break in and um i just give people the advice that i wish that i would have had that's so wonderful yeah thank you so can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and how you embarked on this career path of course. So I um, actually, got, I was a kid actor. So that's kind of how I got started. Um, I was, I'm from the Philadelphia area. So uh, M. Night Shyamalan filmed a lot of stuff oh, where yes. I'm from. Uh, so basically anything that was shot in Philly, I had a very small part in. Um, and ultimately when I was in high school, I went to uh, a a boarding school, but I was a day student. So it was more common to maybe take a year off in between high school and college. Um, and so I deferred from Northwestern and I was like, I'm going to move out to LA for one year and I'm going to audition. Uh, and the year that I got out there, it was 2007. And so for those of you who know, it was the writer's strike. And yeah. so the industry totally shut down. All of my dreams were crushed. I couldn't even get a job for a while in retail because everyone who was working in the industry was suddenly laid off. Right. And so all of those jobs were taken. I ended up, I worked at, um, in the Grove, there used to be a flagship Abercrombie and Fitch. Oh my goodness. So I worked, yes. I worked there before the rebrand, before it was cool. This is actually Abercrombie. Now I wear oh, it nice. as an adult. <laughs> <laughs> it looks um, great. Yeah. And I was like a reservationist at a fancy steakhouse. And, um, but it was, it was a really tough year. You know, I was 18 living in LA by myself. Um, but it really did show me like, oh, LA is the place for me. And during that time, I, I really started to write more. I had always been interested in writing. I'd always, you know, been doing creative writing in high school. I, um, for a creative writing project, I wrote half of a feature. So it was something that I was intrigued by. Uh, and I got an internship, I guess it was an illegal internship because technically I wasn't in college, uh, with uh, these producers, Chuck and Larry Gordon, who um, are, are like titans in the industry. They did the first two Die Hards, they did Point Break, they did Field of Dreams. Oh, Classics. those are like all the movies I have been watching throughout the pandemic, especially like uh, Die Hard and Point Break, because yep. I've been doing spin and I, I love oh. the soundtracks to action movies to spin <laughs> to. So helpful. But yes, like you're running away. <laughs> like I'm running and they're chasing me. The wave is about to catch me. That's but so funny. Those are such classics. Amazing. They are real classics. Um, I will say it is funny as you know, I listen to a lot of movie soundtracks so much so that my Spotify wrapped at the end of the year is like 
Hans Zimmer, like Steve Jablonski. It's all of these just, you know, and then maybe there was Taylor Swift in there too. Um, A but... woman of magnificent taste. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but yeah, it was so, you know, that year was super interesting because while all of my friends and peers were out in college having fun and, you know, I was living in an apartment by myself in LA reading scripts and uh, I lived near the Grove. And so I would walk to that Barnes and Noble whenever I didn't have work. And I would, um, I was in such financial straits that I would bring my own tea bag and just ask for a cup of hot water at Barnes and Noble. And I would sit there and I would read Save the Cat and I would read scripts and, um, you know, it just really got me interested in the idea that I could be a screenwriter. Um, And so I, I went to Northwestern when that gap year was up and I loved the people, but I was very cold. Uh, <laughs> Chicago winters. <laughs> your eyelashes stick together Mm -hmm. and like the hairs in your nose freeze like it is above and beyond and and I'm from Pennsylvania like I'm not a wuss but it it's cold um and I ended up transferring back to to USC and um in one of my screenwriting classes I wrote the first act of a script called the house dad that was basically Mrs. Doubtfire meets the house bunny and, um, you know, I, I showed it to, to Chuck, who I had interned with when I was on my year off. And, and he was like, there's really something here. Keep working on it. And so I, I kept working on it uh, while I was a SAT tutor and while I worked in the office at the Princeton Review. And wow. I was really at this point where I was kind of like, is this something that I can even pursue is this you know a viable career path for me I don't I don't know how I'm gonna make it uh and I was at a USC tailgate I like to say that I was a boxed wine to the wind (laughs) and this girl comes up to me and she was like you are my screenwriting class I have thought about your script that you wrote so much did you ever finish it because I'm an assistant at Gersh and I want to give it to my boss. Wow. And two weeks later, I was wrapped. And a month later, we went out with that script with Chuck and Larry, my old internship bosses, attached. That's and incredible. Yeah. It's, I mean, like, talk about fate or luck or, I mean, it really is opportunity meets preparedness because what a, what a weird, you know, I, I, I always say that I literally tripped and fell into this career. Um, Mm -hmm. drunkenly because, you know, I I ran into Hillary at at this event, but, you know, I had a a really good script ready. Um, And if she had said, did you ever finish, you know, the first act that you wrote in the class? And I was like, well, I was going to get around to it, but I never did. None of this would have happened. 100%. And I was thinking about that, that, um, that your internship, um, Chuck and Larry, you said? Yeah. And it's um, so funny. I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry was actually, they were named that as like kind of a jab to. Oh, to wow. Larry. <laughs> that, that's kind of amazing. I would feel like a lot of people, if they were given that feedback, you have something here, keep working on it. Yeah. I feel, I don't know if they give you more specific feedback or like notes or anything like that, but I feel like yeah. people would be simulta- simultaneously encouraged hearing that, but some people might feel a little bit like, where do I even begin? Like, yeah. I thought this was it, especially with like their first screenplay. So it was yeah. really cool that you took it and ran with it. Well, and I'll say too, Chuck actually um, passed away last year and he was like more than a mentor. He was very much a friend. I'm um, so sorry. And thank you. And he, um, what had happened was when I graduated, I went to his office and I was just, you know, I like to check in, uh, you know, make sure people remember me and, and just, I was checking in with him and he was like, so what are you working on? What are you writing? And I told him, I said, I'm, I'm working on this script and here's the, here's the, the log line. And he was like, I want to read that. And I was like, well, I only have 30 pages. And he was like, I don't care. I want to read it. And I was like, well, it's, I mean, it's not 
where it needs to be at. I don't know. He was like, I don't care. I want to read it. And I was like, well, let me show it to your assistant first. Like I want to get feedback. And he was kind of like, all right, whatever. And the next day he sent me this long email and he said, I just got back from walking my dog. And all I could do was think about your script. I want to read it. And he said, and the other thing I was thinking about was how much of an idiot you are for not sending it to me when I asked you for it. Send me your pages. And I was like, okay, I'll send them. And so when I sent them, it was very rough. And then when he came back with, there's something here, let's, let's keep working on it. Um, yeah, I think for me, it was the validation that I needed, but I think that a lot of people hear, this is great, there's more work to do, and they do get discouraged because it's like, well, I did, I did the work. And I, I had a TikTok that I did a couple of days ago where it really is true, success in this career, you're more likely to, to become a pro athlete than you are to become a pro screenwriter. And so that just tells you the level of work and dedication that you need to be competing at those, those top levels. And so for me, I took it as a positive, um, but I can't say that I took it as a positive when on you know the seventh draft, he still had notes. I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> you know? so, I did it already. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, for sure. That's really interesting. Also, I had this thought. He said, you know, oh, I can't believe like you were an idiot and didn't send it to me when I asked. But I I also feel like maybe that also subconsciously might have helped the situation because I'm sure he has people like just chomping at the bit to send him mediocre work. And yeah. when he, he asked you to and you were like, no, it's not ready. I feel like someone hearing that would be like, oh, like she's a, she's a pro. Like she, she wants to only show quality work. A lot of people would look at someone like that asking to be this huge opportunity and be like, I'll send them whatever I have, anything I have. Yeah. I mean, I think it's twofold because now that I'm in that situation where, you know, I've done mentorship programs or people connect me, you know, people who I know connect me with friends or family friends who are interested in writing. And, and I never say no to, to chat with people. And, and when I chat with people, I normally say, send me your script and I'll, and I'll read it. Um, and a lot of times people don't send me their scripts. They're like, oh, I, you know, I, it's not ready yet. And, and honestly, I forget about it like I get busy. And then sometimes when they do follow up, I don't have time to read it. And so my advice to people is always when you're putting yourself in a position to talk to a pro and they're going to, and they offer their time, accept it. Yeah. Take it for sure. Because, you know, again, sometimes I'm, I'm sorry. I, someone will probably reach out and be like, I did that and you never read it. And I'll be like, I'm so sorry you have to follow up with me. Um, because things just get, things just get busy. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I'm so incredibly thankful to Chuck and I, you know, I wish I could, I wish I could tell him that because it just, he, he really um, opened a lot of doors for me. I'm sure he knew. Yeah, for sure. I think so. That's wonderful. Yeah. So what does a day in the life of Julia York's look like? I mean, it's so funny. I keep trying to make a, a TikTok, a day in the life TikTok. I did one. They are so hard. <laughs> so I funny. literally was trying to do one. I'm like, I'm going to start a new one of like getting ready for a podcast. And I was doing it. I was like, I don't, I don't know how to do this. It's, and, and mine was like no transitions. Like I'm not trying to be cute. I'm not trying to be aesthetic. Like this is just, you know, me holding the camera, eating some soup. And <laughs> I just like, I don't, I don't understand how people do it. First off, like, I don't really need people to see how I look most days, most of the time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's funny. I, so it really depends. This career is so varied. Every day is so different. Um, I normally wake up, eat breakfast, you know, go through the internet 
and then get to work. And it really depends on what's on my plate. I'm usually juggling multiple projects at once and they're different between, you know, paid projects or um, spec projects that I'm working on on my own. Um, you know, like the other day I, I had an episode of a kid's animated show that was due. So I did that in the morning and then, um, you know, go for a little hot girl walk if the weather in New York is, is allowing. Uh, and then come back and I did, uh, I'm working on a pitch for a project with um, a producer friend of mine and then a, a larger producer and we have the IP to a Japanese horror movie. So Ooh. we're coming up with a take on that so that we can go out and, uh, and pitch that. So um, things like, I mean, super fun, it's things like that, try to get Try to get a workout in. I'm also currently planning a wedding, so that is a part-time job. Congratulations! Thank you, thank you. It's uh, you know, we've postponed now five times, so and we're actually legally married, so um, <laughs> it's a little less. I wouldn't recommend people wedding planning for three years. I think that's too long, but uh, <laughs> we're just like you guys wedding. both feel very impatient about it. No, I mean, so we we were 2020. September 2020 was supposed to be our date. So we started planning, got engaged in September 2019, started planning right away. And uh, we've since pushed it to April 2022. Uh, and it's just been, a, it's, you know, this is the closest we've ever gotten to actually having the wedding, which is very exciting. It's also at that point now where I have to pay everyone. And I feel like for the past three years, I've been like, wait, I, <laughs> wait, I, have to, I thought I already paid you. I, I thought this I was mean, like in it. my mind. This right. was for funsies. <laughs> right, I thought this was free. Um, so it's very fun, very exciting, but we actually, we ended up eloping at the end of, like, a, like about a month after our, our first initial date. Oh, that's um, so sweet. So yeah, it was fun, but now we get to have the big party, which is even more fun. That's wonderful. So you, yeah. you're just like, you have your hands in so many different things right now. I'm busy. I'm, I'm definitely busy. It's, uh, it's, it's been a lot. Wedding planning is a part-time job and then really being a writer at the level that I'm at where you have paid projects, but also you're juggling um, projects that you you hope will get you paid. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot. You have to be very self-motivated. Um, and for me, I, I use, uh, playlists, hence the Hans Zimmer and Steve Jablonski to, uh, kind of go from project to project. So if I'm working on a kid's animated show, maybe I'll listen to the Ugly Dolls soundtrack. And then if I'm switching gears to a horror movie, maybe I'll listen to like the Get Out soundtrack. Very so spooky. <laughs> yeah, very spooky. It's, um, it's, it's, it's been really, it's, it's fun. It, you know, I, I can't complain about, about my job. I, I really do love what I do. That's wonderful. Do you ever yeah. get writer's block? Of course. How do you deal with it? Um, I love to walk it out, going on walks getting away from the computer. Um, and then my biggest tip, I guess, is that I will watch content that is in a similar genre uh, or, you know, theme to what it is that I'm, that I'm trying to write. And nine times out of 10, I unblock myself. That's really cool. Yeah. That's yeah. so I'm always fascinated by hearing how people deal with writer's block. I have a friend that throws axes. He's a novelist and he goes out into the woods and he throws axes. axes. <laughs> it's like, cool. uh, I thought it was like a really cool way to like unlock whatever was like hiding within. It's almost as if the words are in his like muscles. It's kind of oh cool. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, I I love yours too. That's really get weird. out. Of, I mean, it's it's like it's a lot more tame. Get out a lot of pent up aggression that way. You get go um, on your walk. I feel like there's something about like loosening loosening the body to help loosen the mind. I just like to not think about like if I overthink it, it's not gonna work. At least at least for me. For some people, if they sit and kind of stare at it for a while, they can figure it out. But for me, I just need to take some time away and be inspired. And also it's a great excuse to uh, watch 
more TV, which is my favorite pastime. So uh, during the day, it's always, it's always great. For sure. Definitely. <laughs> so um, a big piece of advice many people hear is write what you know. And you talked about this a little bit on a TikTok video okay. that you posted. You said, write what you know to feel true. Can you talk a little bit That's about so nice that? That's so that I said that. Um, yeah. <laughs> You're like, oh my God, I'm brilliant. Yes, you <laughs> are. <laughs> um, giving good advice. Yeah, I think um, I think that people take that too literally, right? What you know. And I think in that TikTok, I said a lot of the stuff that I, that I write, um, you know, originals that I write, even some of the, the IP that I take on have a lot of themes of, of grief and it deals a lot of like motherhood. And I personally have not had, you know, I think everyone has, has experienced some form of grief, but I, I've been very lucky, I think in my life. Um, and also I'm not a mom. Um, I just write on kid shows. So, uh, I think that, you know, I don't, that's not what I know, but I know what it feels like to lose and, and to feel, to feel hurt. And, um, you know, I, I understand parenthood and, you know, based on my own experience with my parents. So, uh, I, I think that it's, it's writing the characters, um, it's like more like writing emotions than, than writing what you know. And, and I do think that that advice makes for a lot of semi-autobiographical scripts from, from newer writers, uh, where it's usually someone who's young and in an art field and they, they don't know what they're doing with their life. And, and, and that's all well and good, but you are more than, than, you know, the reality of your, situation, you have a lot more knowledge and depth and understanding that you can play with. And imagination. Um, and imagine like the writers of Marvel movies are not superheroes, right? Like, but they understand, uh, you know, heroicism and, you know, you have those, those emotional moments and those character arcs and those character moments. So um, I, I do think that that it's, it's not bad advice. It's just usually wrongly interpreted. Definitely. And I think that that advice that you give is so beautiful because it could be used by artists of any form. And yeah. I feel like using what you feel to be true is what sets you apart from other artists in your field because everyone's coming from a different emotional experience. Yeah, a hundred percent. And it's like, I mean, it, it's like anything else. It's like acting. It's like, like you're, you're tapping into people can't just act parts that they've experienced. You're, you're tapping into your empathy. And, you know, I think writers are, are very, you know, insightful, like, like observational people. And, and so um, it's not just what you know, but what you've seen or what you believe to be true. I just think there are so many different levels to, to play with with that. That's beautiful. Oh, uh, <laughs> I love it. You're, you're full of gems. She's a poet. <laughs> she is. So, but I love it and you know it and we're gonna embrace it. You know, it's so, it's so funny on um, my last episode, we were talking about the, um, our bad habits that we have sometimes an inability to accept praise. And I love a confident lady. I love a confident lady that loves what she does. That's passionate about what he, what she does. Um, that's amazing. I appreciate that. But also if you're ever like, Oh my God, I love your shirt. I'm like, thanks. I got it for $5 at <laughs> or like, Oh, like you look pretty today. Like thanks. I literally like licked the ground. Like before, you know what I mean? Like I'm very, <laughs> the there. ground. <laughs> like, <laughs> so I, but I do, I think that it's important to be, you know, I have a TikTok in my draft about how uh, you have to be some, a little bit delusional to, to be trying to, to be in this field or any field. Like you really do have to believe in yourself if other people are going to believe in you. And, you know, one of the things that I, that I know for sure is like, I know that I'm 
good at this. And, and I'm, I'm not in a place anymore. Obviously it's always great to get positive feedback, but, um, and, and I, it's, it doesn't mean that I don't have my moments of feeling imposter syndrome or anytime I get a new, a new contract for something. I'm like, do I remember how to do this? Am I, is this going to be good? Um, can I live up to what I've, what I've promised? But I do always know that I'm good at this. And, and I think that, you know, if you don't believe it, no one else is going to. So what would you say to someone that was struggling with self-belief? Like, gosh, this is so difficult to phrase when you are feeling that imposter syndrome, when you're feeling, you know, less than confident on a particular day, how do you get back to that groundedness in your, you know, in what you do and your, your confidence in who you are. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's twofold or multiple folds. It's got many layers. Uh, but one of them is having a supportive for me anyway, it's having a support system. My husband is so insanely supportive and I always, you know, walk in and I'm like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. This is going work. And, and, and he's, yes, you do. You know what you're doing. Like you're great at this. You'll figure it out. And um, so that's really helpful to have at least one person in your life who um, you can vent to and and tell your insecurities to who's going to kind of buck you up and, and make you feel better. Um, but also, I think for me, I personally, um, if I like vent too much about my fears, then they almost tend to take on a life of their own. So I really kind of stop it with just vocalizing it you know, once or twice to a trusted partner. And then, um, I just kind of suck it up and, and, and deal with it. Like at the end of the day, um, like I said, this is a very, uh, self-motivated field. Yes. You, you have to sit down and write. And sometimes you have deadlines. Sometimes you have to self, self-impose those deadlines. And so really for me, it's just getting my ass in the chair and, and doing it. And, and I, I had another TikTok where I, I think I, I say that one of the most rewarding things about this job is all of a sudden you just look down at your screen and you're like, there are 60 pages here that didn't exist before. Like there are characters here that I've given life to. There are scenarios here that I just pulled out of my ass. And I just personally, to me, like that's, that's magic. And and even if they're not the best pages I've ever written, they're, they're on the page. And so, um, so yeah, I just, I, I just kind of shake myself out of it. <laughs> you just like reminded me of one of my favorite Harry Potter quotes, which is like, words are the most inexhaustible form of magic. <laughs> so it's beautiful. True. That is really beautiful. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, so I, I'm like, I'm like literally lifting most of my questions from watching your TikTok videos because I can't <laughs> stop. But you also talk about how connections and relationships in the industry can often be misconstrued for like nepotism. Yeah. What, what would you say to someone who's like not all that comfortable that makes it maybe is like a little bit irksome to like get out there and network? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really, it's tough. It's, you know, I... I think I present as an extrovert, but I get, I'm an only child, like Me too. really, really, are you really? <laughs> yeah. I'm a major introvert, which it's I, weird that I have a podcast. I, I can't it? even believe it, but yeah. It's so, it's so interesting. Cause it's like, you know, I, I will, I'll definitely be in the mix, but if, if I need to recharge, recharging is home by myself on the couch watching TV. Like that is, that is for me recharging. Um, I really need alone time. I really need downtime. And I, it's uncomfortable to think about like a networking event and showing up and not knowing anyone and, and walking around and, and having to meet people. And, and I think that, you know, with the pandemic, it's been, that's been less of an issue, which I think has been, has been good for a lot of people. Um, I think the best way to network with the screenwriting community, the way that things currently are, especially if you are a newer writer, is to be on Twitter. 
there is a really large, very welcoming, um, like emerging writer community on Twitter. And, you know, some of it, I think it, it depends. Like, it seems like there is definitely, um, there's probably some toxic positivity. There's, there's probably, there seems like there's like some drama that uh, you don't want to get involved with. But overall, to me, it looks like such a supportive community that um, if I were a newer writer, that's where I would go. And there's also a ton of pros who are totally just so open and gracious with their advice that they're willing to give. Um, and so that's where I would start with networking. And it's a little bit easier because you're behind behind a screen. For sure. Yeah. I yeah. feel like nowadays, um, if you're kind of nervous about uh, meeting people in like an in-person environment, a Zoom room is a little bit easier because you can just like quickly look and be like, I'm safe. I'm in my home. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and there's almost like a filter for like what you're about to say because you're you're like being filmed so you can see yourself and maybe you can second guess like oh maybe I shouldn't say that silly thing that might be awkward or it <laughs> instead is, of in person true. although I will say I was always the big fan of like excuse me I need to run to the bathroom at these networking events and then just like taking a moment to be like okay am I I don't know anyone here and I feel really awkward let me just like go stand by myself <laughs> yeah, that makes courage. me so happy that you do that do I do that even like not even just at networking events at like parties I'll just like like go to the bathroom and just like sit in the quiet for like a second a hundred percent because sometimes it's just like it's hard to be on it's hard to be on and and I think too that advice you know it's not I'm talking a lot about networking events as if those are like exist and they're like a thing that I've been to a lot I mean in that video I talk about how um my first internship with Chuck and Larry came because I got a hold of the UTA job list from my SAT tutor's son, who was an age or was an assistant at UTA. And I just happened to mention to her, like, oh, I'm super interested in moving to LA and taking a gap year. And she's like, oh, like I should connect you with my son. Right. And so, so it's cool. those people that your parents are like, oh, so and so's daughter, twice removed, cousin, you know, it, like is in the entertainment industry. And you're always like, mom, I don't, you know, parents Wait, are like I'm experts at networking for us. But it's true. And it's, it's just it, like, sure, why not? Especially yeah. in this industry where, you know, it's so helpful to have any sort of advice and just, you know, one, one point of contact can be the difference between you hearing about a job and, and not hearing about a job. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, love that so much. <laughs> so I have a section on the show called silly questions to take super seriously. <laughs> okay. And I have got a silly question for you. How many times have you burst into song in a New York city cab or was it just the one time? I never. I, I am <laughs> referring to a scene from your acting reel. Oh my God. That, was so embarrassing. <laughs> that is so funny. I was like, what have you, like, do you what like is she camera talking money? about? Wait, that's so funny. Yes. Oh yeah. Is. I sent a camera crew to follow you around. <laughs> well, because now I live in New York. And so I'm like, what? Um, that is so funny that you say that. The funniest thing was, that was, it was filmed in Philly. So I was my, my Philly in, I, in the back of the cab with David Morse, it was the show called hack, which was about a taxi cab driver by day who solved crimes by night. Amazing. And I was on the pilot. I know great, great premise. I think it lasted for a season. I was on the pilot and I was in the back of the cab singing, I am 16 going on 17. And the funny, we're going to play practice. That's like, <laughs> you want to hear my song? It was so cute. I, the funniest part was I was 13 and I pulled a Mila Kunis and they were like, oh, you know, how old are you? And I was like, oh, I'll be 16. I just didn't say I'll be 16 in three years. And so I got, Not a I lie. got part. That's amazing. <laughs> Me how did you do you remember how you felt in that moment like like sort of omitting in that way were you nervous 
Yeah, I was definitely nervous because I was so much younger and there were, I think, two other girls, two or three other girls in that scene who were all older. And so they were all like in high school and I was, I think, in middle school. And so I just had to be like, yeah, no, totally. Like boys, like I, you know, what I mean? <laughs> they're not gross like, at all. <laughs> I've been drunk at a party before too, you know? So it was, uh, it was funny. Uh, it was definitely it was definitely funny, but I love, I love being on set. Um, and I'm super excited to, that's, that's one of my like goals this year is to, to get back on set. So hopefully one of the projects that I'm, that I'm working on is, is going to go into production and that, and I'll be able to do that. Cause I didn't get to go to one up when they were shooting because of COVID. So, right. I'm, I'm pumped. That is so funny that you said that. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited for you. I, I can't wait to see um, you in your next project. And I'm very excited yeah. about the prospect of this horror film. That sounds fantastic. I like, I want to be someone that watches horror films. So I'm slowly starting to watch more and more, but I get real spooked really easily. No, I agree. I'm similar, but um, I think that that uh it's it's been really fun to craft this pitch and to find the scares and it's like going beyond what scares just me because I'm very easily scared to what will scare the masses uh so it's been and also have that like psychological thriller twist so that's been really fun um but again it's that is um that's a pitch that we're doing that I'm attached to the IP uh but that's not a guarantee that it'll, that it'll go. There's so much there that's, that's attached to the project that to me, it, it's, it's a no brainer. It makes sense. But um, so much of the work that you do as a professional screenwriter is unpaid in the hopes of getting paid. And then a lot of times it doesn't go anywhere. So it's a, uh, it's a very, it's, it's a roller coaster of a career for sure. How do you, uh, how do you deal with that kind of I feel like that's a form of rejection, right? When you work on something for so long and then it doesn't go, like, what do you yeah. do for your self mental health self-care when something like that happens? I give myself a day to, to be upset, um, or to just kind of be, be down, you know, at the end of last year, the last six months of, of 2021, I was working on, uh, I was pitching three different projects and they were all features they were each in a different genre. One was like a stepbrothers-esque comedy based on IP. One was um, kind of like an art house movie based on a Polish film that we actually sold. Um, and then the other was this Japanese horror movie that we're still, still working on. And at the end of that six month process of like, sometimes I was doing I was usually doing two a days of pitches, but sometimes it would be, oh, I'm pitching the comedy in the morning and I'm pitching the, you know, art house movie in the evening. Like it was just very grueling. And I got to a point where I was like, if one of these three doesn't go, I just spent the past six, of, six months of my life not making any money and devoting all my time and energy to these projects and I'm going to have nothing to show for it and right. so it was it was really tough um and it was a that was more of like a week or two of me just being very down um and then ultimately one of them sold so um yeah it's cool but it's it's such a crapshoot you know like it it really is it's it's tough there are been I've learned my lesson which is to just not get too attached to projects um there was one last year it, I was up for um a reboot of a very big franchise uh or like a sequel that they're doing for a very big franchise and I wanted it so bad like I was like this is career changing this is life changing this would be so huge for me and for about two months, I was working on it with them, various uh, iterations of the pitch, pitching it to various uh, people within the company, and ultimately I didn't get it. And that one, that one hurt. That took I me can out. like I, feel it off of you. Yeah, I, I was, would imagine. 
it took me out of, and I was just so proud of what I had created too. And since it's IP, since it's, you know, it's their original story that they are, you know, already had a very successful movie and they want to make a sequel. So it's not like I can then take that idea that I created and do something else with it. Like Mm -hmm. that's, it's based on their idea. So um, it was a lot of work for nothing. And I still am like, Oh, I just wanted it so bad that that was one of the only ones that that hurt that I allowed to hurt because I just got so hyped up on the fact of what it could mean for me career wise. And so I really just try I try not to do that because, you know, I've had I've had a signed contract before and the deal still fell through. So, wow. you know, it's just never count my chickens until that paycheck is in the bank. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, and I appreciate your candor. I can, I can honestly, I feel it off of you and I, I just appreciate your candor and your vulnerability. Would you say that like, even an experience like that, because you, you did get, um, some writing, like more writing and more, I don't know if you like turn in your full script for, for these opportunities or just like yeah. your pitch. Yeah. So for me, the level where I'm at, the goal is that I'm getting paid to write a full script. Got it. So at this point, it was for this project in particular, um, I was coming to them with a take. And so initially it was just like a paragraph of what I wanted to do with this. But as the process, as those months kind of went on, it became not an outline, but, you know, a, a nine page pitch of here's what happens in act one here's the midpoint here's the characters and and their their bios and and kind of their arcs um and the same with the other pitches as well that I did those three pitches at the end of last year it's like a 20 minute you know me just talking followed by q a so it usually those meetings are usually 45 minutes to an hour but it's really just the writer who's out there pitching, even if there are other attachments. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of work and you know, it, it, it might not work. A lot of things, a lot of times when, um, actors get rejected, like they don't hear back from auditions. Right. Um, a big thing that we hear is, well, it was a win to be in the room. Mm-hmm. And I, it sometimes like, doesn't really like help deaden the disappointment, but I try to keep that in mind. And I feel like th- this applies here too. Like that is a badass project to be like one of the final writers considered. That's pretty yeah. amazing. No, it's true. It definitely is. Um, I think that, and that's true. I mean, it's definitely true. And if you do a good job, then, you know, people will remember that and and they'll want to work with you. And 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 that I think is, something that is very nice that my my reps always say um after I've had a meeting with someone or if they pass on a project they'll say they passed but they want to be in the Julia York's business and that's very sweet because you know it's it's very nice it, it's also that's like, amazing I love it money. <laughs> but, but <laughs> it is very sweet because you know this entire industry for acting as well it's all about building fans so that when the right project comes along you're there. Um, the thing with the entertainment industry and with, you know, execs for, for production companies and studios that is so interesting is they really move frequently. There's a lot of movement, less so with casting directors, I would say, but, um, granted they're picking up different projects, but they're usually at the same company. Um, and with execs, there's a lot of turnover and that can be, a negative, but it can also be a positive. Like the, the way that I got one up was because I met an exec at a different company for a general. And then when he moved to Buzzfeed, he wanted to bring me in to talk. And so at that point we'd already met, he'd already read my stuff. Um, it was a second meeting as opposed to a first. So we were more familiar with one another and, you know, that opened the door for me to get the opportunity to pitch on, on one up. That's wonderful. Yeah. So before I come up, before I ask my final important question, (laughs) where can our listeners follow you? 
Yes, you can follow me on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter. It's all at Julia Yorks. Beautiful. Yeah. Julia, are you okay? <laughs> I, is it okay if I say that I am? You, you can say whatever you want. <laughs> I'm just trying to have like a real conversation about like what's happening in our lives. Yeah, I mean, I think for everything that's going on in the world and just like in general, I, I think that I'm doing okay. Um, surprisingly, you know, it's been a crazy couple of years yes. uh, for everybody. And, and I think, you know, I will say on the positive side, I, I definitely think that I used to be a lot more like rigid and not as spontaneous um, pre-pandemic. I actually, I had this moment um, right when the pandemic started and everyone was stuck at home and everyone, it was at that point where people were starting to get frustrated from being stuck at home. And everyone was like, I have to work from my house and there's no work-life balance. And, and I had been working from home by myself since 2017. And I looked around at my life, like not physically, but emotionally. And I realized that there wasn't that much of a difference for me between my life pre-pandemic and then my life during the pandemic. Interesting. And that was like a gut punch because what was I doing? Like, what was I doing with my life? Like I was home all the time working. And then a lot of times during the week, I would stay home because, you know, watch TV. It's that, it's that, you know, your nine to five is the end of your life. And and it really was like, oh, I need to live a life outside of my nine to five. Like I need to, to not have such a reliance on, on my home life. I need to make sure that I'm getting out there and seeing friends and, and doing stuff. Like, and I kind of vowed when this part of the pandemic, when this lockdown part of the pandemic is over, I want to like live life more. Like I want to do more. And, and I think it's made me just a lot more flexible in my thoughts. You know, my husband and I were talking about, do we move to another country for six months or in terms of going places and traveling? Like it's just, it's made me be a lot more open and, and really want to live to quote Kourtney Kardashian. Like I just, <laughs> I'm like, just living life. Like I just want to, I, I want to do that more. And I, and I do think that, um, you know, I think that I'm, I'm making strides in that. So that, that makes me happy. I think that's so beautiful. I'm so happy you're doing that. And that's so, <laughs> that's such a wonderful realization to have. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's scary to think, you know, I'm in my thirties and, and you're like, what am I, what am I doing? What, you know, I, I'm not, we don't have kids yet. Like we have the responsibilities of work and, but what are we doing? Like we, we can have we can have more fun. We can do more things. Um, I relate so to that so much too. Like yeah. I'm in my thirties as well. I'm single. And I always had like, I have so many bucket list destinations mm -hmm. to hit. And I've always like, kind of had it back in my head. I was like, oh, this is a place like I would want to go with, like with my future partner too, which I think is like yeah. a lovely thought to have, but I'm like, why am I waiting? I could do that and have a great time on my own or even with a Where's girlfriend that? like I don't you know life is gonna pass us by no matter what we do we might as well yeah. live it to the fullest yeah and it just kind of shook me out of it a little bit because I feel like these two years um you know kind of flew by and were kind of all the things that I wanted to do you know we didn't get to do it and and I just I just think that um yeah, if, if nothing else, it's kind of just jolted me awake a little bit more, um, which is, which I think is, I think is a good thing. She says, yeah. going to lay on her couch. <laughs> <laughs> Same, says the girl still wearing pajama pants. <laughs> it's fine. We're doing great.
my my life starts tomorrow, right? Like that's the <laughs> we'll be adventurous tomorrow. <laughs> Julia, this was so lovely. I'm so happy you you agreed to join me. Uh, it was so fun. You're so insightful and wonderful and beautiful inside and out. Thank you oh, so so thank much. Thank you. You're so sweet. This was such a blast. Yeah, I'm so glad. Yay. We will see you guys next time. This podcast was produced by Jason Crow and me, Pamela Portnoy, with music by Jordan Ross Weinhold. You can follow the show on Instagram and Facebook at No One's Okay. And please don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. We love kind reviews. No One's Okay is also on YouTube. So if you want to see our faces, please subscribe to our channel. An extra special thank you goes out to Sean Moore, Claire Palmer, Jackson Palmer, Tiffany Hamoff, and Alexa Marie Anderson. This podcast was recorded at Soundworks Studios. Thank you so much for listening. See you next time.